Oh, hi, I'm Dr. Silver from uh, St. Louis, and I've been asked to give a workshop on in vitro maturation, IVM. And uh, all this is available to you uh, via IVF Worldwide. Uh, now, I'll just start out by saying there have been many erudite papers on IVM over the last 20 years or so. Uh, and I did have slides with all those references, hundreds of references, uh, just to show you how much work has been done on it. But I decided that would waste a lot of time. But I, I can send you a list of all those references. Nonetheless, uh, it never really became popular, except now. We're in the year 2020, where suddenly it's really going to be very popular. We have success rates, and uh, it, it's finally reached its stage. I'll explain a little bit about it. It can be confusing. Well, first place, I'm sure you've all had the same experience with your conventional IVF that we've had. Uh, formerly, we used to disregard GVs and only to ICSI on the metaphase two or M1s that shortly thereafter became M2s. But now we continue to culture, which many have done, uh, with no added FSH or HCG, the GVs we retrieve at the time of IVF to see if they become M2s in 24 or 48 hours. Well, certainly the ones at 48 hours are no good. But at 24 hours, uh, just recently, of the last 132 GVs that we just cultured on, 68% became M2 oocytes by the next day, and 61% resulted then in normal 2PN fertilization. So we know that uh, that's easy to do because it really was in vivo uh, hormones that allowed this in vitro maturation to occur. But uh, let's go on to something much more spectacular than that obvious part. So we're not really the experts. I, I don't wanna claim that we're experts. It's just that we understand it from our collaborations with Dr. Hayashi and others, and Dr. Uh, Klaus Anderson. And I'm gonna explain why and how it works because it may seem puzzling and then how you do it. So this all began with real experts trying to uh, culture primordial follicles for from the ovary tissue of cancer patients. Epic and Woodruff and Shea and Telfer, Albertini, Gilchrist, Smits, many others, trying to culture resting follicles from primor uh, from oocytes from primordial follicles for cancer cases. It there have been claims of success, but it's been very unimpressive, not very good. Hayashi compared primordial follicles in ovarian tissue to in vitro IPS cell derived oocytes and found that primordial follicles are locked. And he figured out how they're locked and why that made all these previous attempts at IVM uh, so hopeless. First place, he shocked uh, the endangered species uh, world when at a convention he said he would, to preserve their uh, fertility, he'd rather have skin than ovarian tissue. And to understand why IVM works, you must understand in vitro gametogenesis. That's the beginning to really understanding why it's very, IVM is very simple. You'll be shocked when you see how simple this is really, but you need to understand what in vitro gametogenesis is about in order to understand why IVF is so simple. Now, Gilchrist, who is the master researcher in this field, asked Hayashi at a, uh, uh, actually a IVF worldwide meeting in Hong Kong, uh, quote, after 20 years of studies, I still have not been able to culture early oocytes to viable M2s. How is this possible? Uh, talking to Hayashi. And how she answered them, primordial follicles are locked by tissue pressure and by intranuclear FOX3, and you need to isolate and stop the nuclear rotation. So it's very, very difficult to try to culture from primordial follicles, resting eggs, actual GV oocytes and M2 oocytes. But it's crazy because in the animal world, that's the way they always do it. Uh, IVM in veterinary sectors, sheep, goats, cattle, pigs, was far more efficient, extremely efficient. So why has it been so problematic in humans to just uh, do IVM when it works in all the other animals? Uh, well, first place, none of the veterinarian groups administer HCG prior to IVM in animals. That HCG prior to IVM was an idea that was attempted by uh, Tan, because there's no other choice, and Chan, and it really isn't ideal. 
Uh, we must understand how oocytes mature naturally in vivo and then replicate that. So I'm going to review in just the briefest terms because, you know, time is definitely limited. Uh, the uh, work that Hayashi and I have done, uh, and this is just a joke, I view him as the tall Japanese guy who's the X chromosome, and I'm the short little American guy who's the Y chromosome. But this slide of Hayashi's is very busy, but what I want you to focus your attention on is the blue lines first, that there are varying stages right from the beginning to the mature and fertile M2 oocyte. And you can, you can tell that by taking the PGC-like cells, uh, the early PGCs, which is the same as the embryonic ones uh, at uh, nine days of fetal life in the human, and you can follow them all the way through to M2 oocytes uh, and, and not have really a problem because there are no primordial follicles to lock them, so to speak. So there are three phases, IVD, in vitro differentiation, that's when this ogonia goes through the process of becoming a GV uh, by uh, or, or, a, or a secondary oocyte by virtue of no hormonal stimulation whatsoever. It's just granulosa cells automatically will make those early oogonias become primary and secondary follicles. But then there's the second stage of IVG, in vitro growth, and that is really dependent on uh, FSH. And you go from secondary follicle and antral follicle. And then you have the third stage of IVM, really, which is only one day. And you can see that with IVG, there's a lot of ingredients down below but the major ingredient is FSH, and we know that, 11 to 14 days. But IVM, the major ingredient is HCG, and it's just one day to convert that GV, that antrophocal from a GV, to convert that into a metaphase II oocyte. That's all. It's very, very quick. And I'll go through these slides quickly because they're attached to it, and uh, it'll be too long to explain it, but I'll explain it better in the following. So here you can compare in vivo uh, maturation uh, on top and in vitro, and you can see with in vivo, uh, the oocytes uh, go through a uh, process of meiosis very much like in vitro, except that it's parsed out. Uh, only uh, only a small number of resting follicles are allowed to leave that primordial follicle phase and develop. So you get a better picture of oocyte development from looking at it in vitro, believe it or not. For, uh, that's the lower uh, uh, row here, where the PGCs develop for the IVD uh, to secondary follicles, and then with IVG, they develop to an antral follicle. And then finally, in one day, they mature with IVM. And you can see the comparison of in vivo and vitro. So to understand IVM, you must differentiate between IVD, that's the differentiation of the early PGC and early oogonia into a truly an egg. And that's granulosa cell dependent, not hormonally dependent. And then the development to a mature GV, and I call it a mature GV, uh, through gonadotropin, and that's the IVG phase. And finally, one day, so IVM, uh, under the influence of HCG or LH, uh, to develop from a GV to an M2. And so this is just to remind you that primordial follicles are all located in the cortex, and the developing follicles develop uh, towards the inside and the softer area of the, of the ovary. So it's tissue pressure that through various intermediary means, but the basic thing is tissue pressure gradient that uh, locks these primordial follicles. And uh, if you go to the earliest embryo phase, in the early epiblast, cells which are destined to remain eternal, that is germ cells, are separate, have to be separated from the rest of the embryo because the rest of the embryo is differentiated. So these uh, PGC uh, specify, specified cells have to get specified very, very early in order to remain eternal. In vitro gametogenesis just copies this in vivo process, and we wind up with 
oocytes that actually are extraordinarily young because we're just recreating embryology. And this is another diagram that just shows we can go from uh, in vivo, from ICM to epiblast to PGCs, but we can also make epiblast-like cells from embryonic stem cells and make PGC-like cells that function just like uh, normal PGCs. And we're recreating the normal process of embryology, which is uh, PGC specification at nine or 10 days of uh, human fetal life. And, uh, and realize that the in vitro, we know that this development to an egg is via granulosa cells to a GV is automatic uh, and is caused by uh, being surrounded by granulosa cells. Granulosa cells, shockingly, do not seem to be necessary after that stage. So this is simply an outline of making an oocyte in vitro. And, and I will call your attention to the bottom three lines. So PGCs with granulosa cells uh, in an aggregate for three weeks in the mouse. So that's in vitro differentiation, IVD. FSH culture then for 11 days, sometimes longer, and that we call IVG. And that's how you prepare, the, prepare that GV for meiotic competence. And, and it has to be prepared by FSH for meiotic competence, but it's still a GV. Finally, HCG culture, just one day, is IVM. And that takes the germinal vesicle that is meiotically competent and really turns it into an M2 rather quickly. So that's what normally happens. So this culture system of IVD, IVG, IVM explains why IVM is really so easy to do and can be so simplified that I, I predict it will be more and more popular uh, very shortly. And this is just a summary of the circularity of uh, Hayashi's work. Uh, and notice he uses the word, this is his word, automatic for IVD. Granulosa cells are not dependent on hormones. It's an automatic production of primary oocytes uh, from uh, the PGCs. And then it's FSH that is necessary uh, for making a mature GV. And finally, one day of HCG is all you need to make uh, a good M2 oocyte from a mature GV. So this is just a picture of the aggregate of these uh, early PGCs with granulosa cells. And uh, one of the tricks that he found is to really get good maturation, you want to open up the granulosa cells in vitro. In vivo, there is really, really good contact. In vitro, you need to open them up uh, if they're going to have good contact with FSH. So this manual dissociation is a crucial part uh, of the uh, in vitro gametogenesis. And it's important to know so that we can know when you get the GV, uh, from the ovary, when do you clean off the granulosa cells? Do you leave them on for a day or two? Well, not really. You want to open them up. So the keys to Hayashi's success are little tricks. No FSH during the first three weeks of culture of PGCLCs. Dissociate and open secondary follicles after two days of FSH, at least for in vitro. And culture isolated follicles with FSH 100 IU per ml. And then strip granulosa cells on the day of HCG culture. As long as the oocytes are fully grown GVs, cumulus cells have already done their job. Now, that's just his opinion. But he's found that uh, he doesn't really need the cumulus cells for oocyte maturation once the GV is meiotically competent. These are just figures that he showed uh, me on the blackboard uh, as to when you actually have a mature GV. And this is what they look like. These were all developed from skin cells. And uh, these, you notice how the granulosa cells have been opened up. And these were the first uh, normal pups born from IPS cells derived from uh, uh, just uh, they're derived from their mother's skin fibroblasts. So Klaus Anderson took us a huge step further this year. Well, earlier than that, but with his publication this year in JARG in February, GVs derived from ovarian medulla during dissection of cortex are huge in number. And, and it's surprising how you can culture them to M2s in large numbers that are actually normal. Uh, 75 MIU of FSH and 100 of HCG 
And the next day you have metaphase two oocytes, 24 to 44 hours. I think the later ones aren't going to be as good as the early ones. The 24 hour ones are ideal. It may not be, he says, to remove the cumulus, but with Hayashi's view, this may not be uh, the best approach. It's probably better to remove the cumulus. Uh, and uh, the, really, his report was quite remarkable. Uh, with 53 M2 oocytes in their first polar bodies, next generation sequencing indicated 64% were euploid. So we don't have to worry about an exceptionally high aneuploidy rate for these in vitro matured oocytes. And the M2 rate was one in three, resulting in a total number of M2 oocytes that was similar to the number you can obtain with ovarian stimulation. So if you have a cancer patient and you're debating whether to take out the ovary or to stimulate her to retrieve eggs, just take out the ovary and you'll be able to get just as many good quality M2s from that ovary tissue without ever having to stimulate her. So uh, this is the possibility to develop an IVF model, Klaus stated this, uh, obtained from a very small antrophollicles. Now, one whole ovary is often surgically excised and the remaining medullary tissue is normally discarded. But immature oocytes, I'm quoting him directly, immature oocytes collected from surplus medullary tissue can be matured in vitro without any previous hormonal stimulation of the patient. I want to explain to you why. Uh, immature oocytes have been aspirated ex vivo uh, with follicles that are normally greater than three to five millimeters uh, and are visible on the ovarian surface, in fact. But you're missing a large number of the GVs from follicles that you really can't easily uh, do with current uh, quality ultrasound. Uh, but Prepubertal girls have not had FSH exposure and they may have a lower maturation rate. But the major point I'm going to make is you get so many more follicles this way and so many more GVs. And uh, these small antrophollicles may span diameters ranging less than one millimeter to 10 millimeters and may be very difficult to aspirate with a needle. Uh, so the nuclear maturation rate has already been established uh, by in vivo FSH. So that's really important. The IVG phase of meiotic competence for the GVs has already occurred in vivo. You don't need any FSH really. And the aneuploidy rate of 36% of these in vitro matured M2 oocytes is no different from in vivo matured standard IVF. So um, some of the uh, clues is that uh, make this thing easier is Frankly, we found that ordinary culture media is all you need. You don't even need IVM media. All you have to do is add to your regular culture media the right concentration of FSH and LH. And it can be anywhere from 75 to 150 uh, milli IU uh, per liter. Now, we, at first we thought just Menopure might be adequate, one to a thousand, but of course that's not true because the real concentration of Menopure is not the 75 uh, milli, uh, IU um, equivalent that's advertised, but it's obviously just 10 of HCG, and you need a much higher concentration of HCG. So we'll go into that in a second. Um, so it's so easy to collect many GVs from tiny follicles, having the ovary in hand instead of using a needle, just like the veterinarians. And once ex vivo, however, they need the, they, we thought they needed to have the cumulus to be open to allow exposure to HCG. The cumulus isn't as important as the oocyte getting, the mature o GV oocyte, getting direct exposure to HCG. Uh, so, they don't need ovarian stimulation because FSH has already created GVs with myotic competence. And they do not even need a normal ovulatory cycle for myotic competence. The only reason we need ovarian stimulation or even the normal ovulatory hormonal cycle for follicle enlargement is either so we have normal mononuclear monoovulation or for oocyte retrieval. I mean, there is absolutely no need for ovarian stimulation other than to make the follicle big enough to aspirate. Uh, otherwise, there's been enough FSH maturation already. So this is just an unedited video, which I'm only gonna, whoops, let me go backwards on that. Um, 
this, I'm going to try to show this video, but it, I guess I'm not able to, uh, with my mouse, get that. Well, um, that could be a problem because this video is a very nice video, but uh, I'm not able to uh, to get it to move. So that won't work. Remember oh, there it works. Okay. In your eye, you almost got pregnant. So I'm going to lower the sound got, on this. Uh, so I'm not going to show the whole five minutes because of time limitations, but I'll give you an idea. This is completely unedited, and we can send to you the entire video just to show you that uh, we dissect the ovary tissue now just the way Gosden originally described it, the way we used to do it, and the way uh, Mayro advocates and Klaus Anderson advocate. We no longer use the template because using the template for vitrification with that process, you lose these GVs. And what we want to do is automatically collect, without even noticing it, all the GVs that are going to be left in the culture media during the process of this dissection. So I'll go to the next one. We have a 38% to 67% maturation of these GVs that we go through no effort to collect. So as Anderson showed, you get as many M2s as with stimulation, but no need for stimulation. Now, uh, there already have been reports of uh, babies, healthy live babies coming from these uh, M2 oocytes that were derived uh, from uh, GVs from ovary tissue. First pregnancy was uh, actually uh, described in 2014, but it didn't become popular because we didn't really understand how it worked or how easy it is to do. Uh, second pregnancy reported by uh, DeVos's group from Brussels uh, with uh, in vitro maturation of oocytes recovered from ovarian specimens. And they thought this was promising and they worked on it, but it took a long time for them to finally publish uh, their most recent paper. And uh, then uh, Nakajima's group and Zuliak reported uh, a healthy baby from this also. Uh, but we're not surprised by the reports from Seegers et al. and DeVos and uh, by Nakajima. Uh, and we're not surprised uh, because uh, the studies by Klaus Anderson showed that these are euploid oocytes and they're every, any way you want to test these oocytes uh, that are in vitro mature, they are normal. So I'll give you an example. So you, this is a workshop, so you'll understand a bit about how to do this. So this was just our first case. I mean, we, we were just following Klaus's protocol. 27-year-old woman with B-cell lymphoma cervix. She had no chemotherapy before. That's important. Right ovary uh, was removed. Uh, the uh, 21 pieces of ovary tissue were able to be obtained, but we did the dissection in the old fashioned way rather than with the template so that we would be able to also obtain JVs. And uh, you can see that we, at that time, we used 75 milli IU of FSH uh, per ml and 100 uh, milli IU per ml of HCG. We're not, we're really not sure FSH is necessary, though in Hayashi studies, he found that continuing the FSH, not stopping the FSH, help the HCG. But basically, you only needed HCG just for one day. So uh, in 24 to 44 hours, we had uh, from uh, 25 uh, cumulus cell complexes, we had 12 uh, metaphase two oocytes, which we vitrified for 48% maturation rates. And that's about as many M2 oocytes as you might have gotten with uh, normal stimulation. And we know uh, from Klaus's studies and the reported pregnancies that these are good oocytes. I want to make the point, though, now that formerly we didn't clean the uh, cumulus cells off until the second day at, uh, at 44 hours. But now it's pretty apparent you'll do better if you clean the cumulus cells right away. That sounds shocking, but that would be the evidence that comes from Hayashi. So here's just an example of the ovary as it comes to us. This is the way we no longer uh, prepare the cortex. We, we really pioneered this and wrote papers on it because it seems to be such an easy way to get a very uh, thin cortical slice, but it needs to be dry. And all those GVs are just lost in the gauze. And so we no longer recommend uh, this method uh, for vitrification or slow freeze. 
So uh, to obtain uh, the GVs, you've got to dissect the cortex and make it very, very thin by hand. And at first I thought, you know, 20 years ago that the cortex would be a little too thick for vitrification if we did it this way. But Mayro uh, showed me that you can get this so thin uh, just manually that it's perfectly good for vitrification. So this is the cortical medullary dissection. And you notice there's always media there. And you notice we're doing this on ice. So doing it on ice is better for the ovary tissue in terms of ischemia time. But on the other hand, it's not as good for the oocytes. Nonetheless, you get pretty good oocyte maturation, even if it's on ice. But Klaus found it and reported in February that it, it, it's better if it's not on ice. So probably the right compromise is to do this not on ice, but to do it quickly so you don't have a prolonged ischemia time. And here you can see we're, we're showing you pictures of every phase of just dissecting that medulla off. Now, Klaus talks about chopping up the medulla later so you find GVs, but there are a huge number of GVs that automatically come out when you dissect the cortical medullary junction. Most of those GVs are really located at the cortical medullary junction. So they're automatically going to appear in that media that you see that we're doing the dissection in. So do not discard the media. That's where the GVs are located. And you can see we're dissecting out the medulla. I'm showing you every step of this. So uh, you know that it's a process where uh, originally described by Gosden in 1994, actually, and that we're reverting to that process because we want the GVs, which before we used to think were not going to be important and we discarded. And just now here you can see a video of we're uh, dis uh, dissecting the latter phases of the dissection. And we're making the cortex as thin as possible, but in this process, we're automatically unleashing a large number of GVs that would have been hard to aspirate with a needle. So you can see that there's still a lot of tissue on there and we're cleaning it off. As we clean off that tissue to get the cortex super clean, we're, we're getting anywhere from 10 to 100 GVs uh, falling out of that into the media. We can get it very thin. You can see how thin we can make it so thin that we can still do vitrification quite safely with that cortex. And we didn't need to use the uh, template. And then we cut it into different squares. And you're all familiar with this. Those are the squares that we're going to vitrify. Some will slow freeze. <clears throat> and uh, both methods are OK as far as I'm concerned. Results are good either way. I think we, I know that we destroy less eggs with vitrification, but if you start out with 200,000 eggs, it doesn't matter if half of them are destroyed by the slow freeze process. So we just divide this up. And at the same time we're doing that, another embryologist is looking at all the media that uh, we did the dissection in. So for, then we do a further dissection of the medulla into tiny bits like Klaus Anderson recommends. And we're just cleaning off the cortex as thin as we can. This is the other side of the cortex. We have two sides, of course, the way we do it. And this is routinely the same we've already shown you. Cleaning off the medulla and obtaining more GVs. It's the final stages of cleaning off the medulla. And, and then we wind up, you've seen many pictures of this with all these little squares, and you can either do a slow freeze or vitrification. We prefer vitrification because it's so much easier and so much quicker. We don't need the freezing machine. But our results with slow freeze that we started doing in 1997, actually, our results with transplanting those uh, tissues back are excellent. Uh, and the reason is you may destroy more eggs, but it doesn't matter because you start out with so many. But so the vitrification, uh, I'm just showing this slide so that you can get copies of it and copy it down. Uh, the, the, the equilibrium solution is no different than with uh, freezing eggs or embryos.
the vitrification solution, however, has to be more viscous with 40% cryoprotectant, 20, and uh, as we normally would make it uh, 20% ethylene glycol and 20% DMSO, and uh, also a higher concentration of sucrose or triolose. And we leave these tissue slices in the ES solution for 25 minutes to get complete absorption. And then in the vitrification solution until these thin tissue slices fall to the bottom. That's usually 15 minutes, but we want to be sure there's been complete absorption. So we'll just show you how we do that. Uh, I know this talk isn't on vitrification, but uh, you might as well see how we do this. Uh, that's in uh, equilibrium solution. And we take it out of the equilibrium solution after 20 foot. You see how it's a very viscous media, so it's not going to fall to the bottom. But then finally, you can see this is in uh, from, from uh, equilibrium solution to vitrification solution. These pieces float on the top, and we're not going to take them out until they've absorbed all the cryoprotectant. And it's so easy to know that just by washing that they fall to the bottom of the test tube. So that means full absorption of vitrification solution and we're ready for vitrification. We put them on a little template and uh, we uh, certainly believe in direct uh, open freezing uh, with sterile liquid nitrogen, but then we store it in a closed system. There you can see we're just placing the uh, very thin slices of uh, cortex and then we just put it right into the uh, liquid nitrogen. Can see that again. We uh, take them just bit by bit. It's I think it's much faster than the slow freeze. We just put it in liquid nitrogen and we're done with it. And we know we really don't need a freezing machine. And we're happy to freeze two at a time. And uh, there you. It's, it's a very simple process. You hardly even need an IVF lab to do it. You can just have a little tiny uh, laboratory space in the operating room. Uh, for thaw, you uh, place the metal strip in a large volume of one molar sucrose at 37 degrees. If you don't use a really large volume, then you're not going to get a rapid enough uh, cooling rate and you will lose them. And then transfer to 0.5 molar for five minutes uh, and then wash and we see no ice crystal formation. This is what the tissue looks like pre-freeze. This is what it looks like post vitrification Our studies long ago showed that uh, we really don't lose any oocytes in this process. Uh, no difference between fresh and frozen. Now, so at the same time that we did that, that we vitrified over cortexes, we're collecting GV oocytes from medullary dissection. Now, frankly, we found a huge number of the oocytes just from the cortical medullary junction. But then, as Klaus recommends, we just still cut up the uh, medulla into many, many pieces. And at first glance, you don't necessarily see uh, all those GVO sites, but they're plentiful and uh, you can find them just under a regular dissecting microscope and just look for them and you'll find them and we'll show you that in just a minute. So in this slide, you can really see, though there's a lot of junk in there, you can see a uh, GVO site with intact uh, compact cumulus cells uh, around it uh, right in the middle of this microscopic field. And that's what you have to look for and pick up. And this is just a macro view of what uh, Leilani, our embryologist, is doing, or one of the other embryologists. You, it really is a good idea to have two embryologists working on this at the same time. And so you get many GVs from this medullary dissection. And we used to just wait till the next day, uh, or even two days later, we'd wait till two days later to clean the cumulus off. Probably, will, uh, it looks like we're getting a much higher maturation rate by cleaning the cumulus off early, and we're certainly not hurting anything. And there'll be many of those GVs that are uh, already M2s by day one. So I think the right compromise is to clean off the cumulus on day one. And you find uh, these are these antral uh, follicles uh, that are absolutely, they're mature GVs. They're, they're mature in the sense that they have their meiotic competence because they've been exposed to FSH in vivo. And there's no need for these fluctuating levels of FSH other than to uh, make sure that ovulation is monoovulation or to make it easy for us to retrieve oocytes from a follicle. 
no other reason for that. They, they have myotic competence. And there you can see after IVM, and we don't, we don't use IVM media. Uh, we just use regular media with uh, the concentration of HCG I just indicated and FSH as well. Uh, the, the HCG is the most important and it all occurs in one day. Um, perfectly normal M2 oocytes. There are some that, of course, haven't matured, but others are perfectly normal. So the second example, a 39-year-old, her reason for freezing was social. It's unfortunate that women are finally thinking about uh, preserving their fertility when they're 38 or 39 years old and not when they're 25. Uh, but that's just the psychology, the normal dynamics. So she did not want ovarian stimulation for a variety of reasons. It wasn't our call. It was her call. And so we took out the right ovary. Uh, she has a low ovarian reserve. We froze the ovary tissue. But we also got two uh, good quality M2s in that process with a very low ovarian reserve. There you can see what her histology looked like. And there were good oocytes, but there were 39-year-old oocytes and not that many of them. Again, you can see that rare oocyte in the field. But there, a good M2 we got from that. So here's example three, a 14-year-old uh, girl with Ewing sarcoma. Uh, and I'm going to go into this for a second. So she had a right uh, We uh, vitrified 21 pieces of ovarian tissue, and I think that'll be plenty for her to be fertile with ovary transplant. Uh, we got 34 cumulus complexes, 13 good quality M2s that were vitrified. So that was a 40% maturation rate. As I said before, I think we can do better than that. Uh, by opening up the cumulus much earlier. But here's what's interesting. Um, what about for prepubertal girls that have had no exposure to FSH, really? Uh, unlike this case, who's 14 years old and uh, in Menarch, uh, we may not get good maturation. I don't know. We may not get good maturation because they've had no in vivo exposure to FSH. So there will be just uh, immature GVs that probably haven't developed their meiotic competence via what Hayashi calls the IVG phase. Remember, there's three phases, IVD, in vitro differentiation, IVG, which is going to add a tropin-induced maturation of the GVs, and finally, IVM, which is just one day, which is a uh, conversion of uh, GVs to M2s. So there's just a picture of that ovary. It's a very good ovary, and there's our dissection. Uh, we do it over ice to protect the cortex, but this will probably reduce the maturation rate. You have to make a, a tough decision on that. I'm going to go through these fast enough. You've already seen this process to uh, reach my time limit, answer questions if there are questions. Uh, so many primordial follicles in these vitrified ovary slices, many primordial follicles, but also for IVM, many GVs found during dissection. And there you can see the GVs. And after IVM, uh, and this was two days later, and I'd rather do it right away at one day. Uh, after that, uh, many euploid M2s. Many euploid M2s we got from her. Example four is the last example. This is a woman who is 30 years old and has a daughter with Turner syndrome. And she did not want to have ovary stimulation. There were religious reasons for it, uh, very obscure, but uh, very strongly held feelings. So we did take out a right ovary, and she would have to obviously have a, a transplant for her daughter with uh, immunosuppression, but we know from the work with uterine transplantation that it works and it's safe. Uh, and uh, But nonetheless, we also want a primordial follicle, so she wouldn't have to have a transplant. So we froze 10 pieces of tissue, but we also were able to freeze 10 very good quality metaphase II oocytes that will be available for her Turner syndrome daughter when she grows up. There you can see the good oocytes. So two more quick slides. A summary of what I said before. Why does it work? Well, because there are many GVs inside the medulla that have had adequate time of exposure to FSH, because there are so many of them. A thousand per month were recruited from primordial follicles four months earlier. They are ready. 
It is so easy to collect many GVs from these tiny follicles by having the ovary in hand instead of using a needle. Once ex vivo, however, they need the we, they need the cumulus to be open to allow for better exposure to HCG. That's controversial, but I think we'll find out uh, with more and more cases that it's better to open the cumulus early. Uh, why do we need ovarian stimulation at all, or even the normal ovulatory cycle? Well, we don't need it. We do not need ovarian stimulation for oocyte maturity. FSH has already created GVCs, uh, GVs uh, in vivo with meiotic competence. We do not even need the normal ovulatory cycle for meiotic competence of GVs even in the normal fertile woman. We only need ovarian stimulation or the ovulatory hormonal cycle for follicle enlargement and either for monoovulation if it's just a normal female uh, or for oocyte retrieval if she's going through IVF and we just technically have to be able to find a way to retrieve those oocytes. But otherwise, we really don't need ovary stimulation with FSH. We just need maturation with uh, HCG. So that's the end of my talk. I've stuck to my 40 minutes precisely. And uh, I'm, uh, I know it's controversial, but I'm available for any questions anytime.